Hello, my name is Nick, and this is Crime Doc. When a body is found in a smoking car, police suspect a terrible accident has taken place. But as you are about to find out, the truth can take you down a dark and dangerous path. This is the case of Jean-Paul Dossier. Whatever you do, do not subscribe to our channel. Every time someone subscribes, I get a small but potent electric shock. So please just give it a rest. This week's story begins on the 12th of February, 1987, in the forest of Marfontaine in the north of France. It's four in the morning and Philippe is driving through the forest on his way to his night job. As he continues on his route to work, in his headlights, he sees the smoking shell of a car slammed into the base of a tree by the side of the road. He stops to have a look, but he doesn't have a torch on him. So he just presumes that whoever was in the vehicle in the accident had been taken to hospital. So he just carries on his way to work. A few minutes later, William, an 18 year old farm worker, drives past the same spot. He as well sees the vehicle and he does have a torch. William cautiously approaches the car and what he sees inside makes him sprint away in horror. In the vehicle is the charred remains of a human. At 4.45 a.m., a police unit is deployed into the forest and it seems pretty straightforward. The car veered off the road for some reason, smashed into a tree. With the impact, the driver lost consciousness and the tank set on fire. When forensics arrive on scene, the victim is no longer recognizable. The charred body is found in the passenger seat as if suddenly the driver came to and was unable to exit on the driver's side, so tried to get out on the passenger side, but then the car was engulfed in flames. According to experts, the car was going between 80 and 100 kilometers an hour when it crashed. Excessive speed for driving in the forest in the middle of the night. They conclude the fire came from a short circuit during the impact. However, when the smoke clears and investigators take a closer look, a couple of things just don't add up. Firstly, when they take a closer look into the car, the handbrake is on. Not all the way on, but definitely enough to slow down the vehicle. Secondly, the car's in first gear. Is it even possible to drive 100 kilometers an hour in first gear? It seems unlikely. Suddenly the theory of a reckless driver hurtling off the road and smashing into a tree seems rather suspect. However, the people at the scene that night could never have guessed in their wildest dreams what actually happened to that unfortunate motorist. The number plate is burnt, but it's intact. And when they run the plates, they find out that it belongs to a man named Jean-Paul Dossier, a 40-year-old male living in Ursel. He is head of sales at a local Renault garage. He has a wife, Jeanette, who is 41, and he has two kids, Paola, 20, and David, who is 16. At 9.30 on the morning of the accident, Officer Leonard goes around to the Dossi family home to break the bad news. Jeanette and daughter Paula open the door and he explains to them what's happened. Failing to mention, however, that the body had been seriously burnt and they couldn't actually identify him 100%. They were waiting for results of dental records to be able to do so. These records would quickly confirm that it is Jean-Paul. Paula tries to console her mum, Jeanette, who had been depressed for several years now. They break the news to Paola's brother, David, who shows little emotion. He never had a particularly good relationship with his dad. Despite being in a state of shock, Jeanette does manage to reply to some of the officer's questions. Jean-Paul earned a good living, the equivalent in today's market of around 3,600 euros a month. The day before the accident, he had visited his family in Le May, a village situated close to his work, but about 45 minutes from home. He left that night at 8.30 p.m. and no one had seen him after. So what was he doing in the forest at 4 a.m., still 40 kilometers from his home? As investigators dig deeper, it takes them down a much more complex and shocking path. 
The autopsy estimates the time of death to be around midnight and they can tell also that he ate food approximately one or two hours before, veal and potatoes to be precise. These results leave investigators with even more questions. If Jean-Paul left his parents home in Leme at 8.30 and they confirm without eating, where did he go to eat and more importantly with whom? If he had driven directly from the house to the forest, it would have only taken him a few minutes. But when the car exploded, his watch stopped. And get this, the time was 2.06 a.m. So how is it possible he was last seen at 8.30 to die a few kilometers away at midnight and for his watch to burn just after 2 a.m.? There's too much time between each of these events for this to make any sense. Road controls are put in place around the forest to question locals who would pass through there on a regular basis. They stop and they talk to anyone they can find who crossed the forest that night between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. And they all confirm that at that time there was no accident. Could Jean-Paul maybe have been murdered somewhere else and then brought to the forest to make it look like an accident? They go back and question Jeanette again. She confirms that he had no enemies that she knew of. At this point, they leave the family alone to mourn, not bringing up the fact that they now think maybe he was murdered. In the meantime, they question Jean-Paul's friends and associates to get to know him a bit better and see if there was anyone that may have wanted to hurt him. This doesn't help a whole lot. Everyone says pretty much the same thing. He was a nice guy, he didn't drink, and he worked hard. There is something, however, for detectives to get their teeth into. Friends hint that maybe he had an affair with a nurse named Nadine. They track her down and she explains that she did have a relationship at one point with Jean-Paul, but when he refused to divorce Jeanette, she broke it off and she hadn't seen him since. She also has an alibi. The night of the accident, she was at a restaurant. It becomes apparent his relationship with Jeanette was not particularly rosy. Her depression was weighing heavily on Jean-Paul's shoulders and friends describe her as a jealous and pretty humorless person, not particularly fun to be around. The chief investigator on this case interviews Jean-Paul's work colleagues and they are convinced that there is something untoward going on here. Having seen the photo of Jean-Paul's car in the paper, they are shocked. They find it hard to believe he was traveling at pace as if so, the car would have been much more damaged by the tree. They also don't understand why he didn't try and escape the vehicle by the back doors and simply just tried to get out through the passenger door. And they highly doubt that the car would have caught fire in the first place with such minimal impact. Five days later, Jean-Paul's funeral takes place under the watchful eye of the local police force, looking out for anything or anyone acting suspicious. Hundreds of people attend to pay their last respects. Jeanette, in front of everyone at the funeral, tells the story of how she met Jean-Paul and that at the time he was dating another woman, but luckily for her, she managed to get pregnant first, so he was forced to marry her. How romantic. Awkward. 11 days after the funeral, Jeanette and the kids go on a skiing trip and her general demeanor is pretty disturbing for some people. She seems on top of the world. She starts uh, buying clothes, going clubbing. People start talking in the villages and she quickly gets the nickname, the Joyful Widow. It's almost as if she's celebrating Jean-Paul's death. However, with no further leads, days turn into weeks and the case goes ice cold. They do keep probing though and they return to see Jeanette. They ask her what she had for dinner on the night that Jean-Paul disappeared. And guess what? She had veal and potatoes, the same meal that was found in the autopsy in Jean-Paul's stomach. Remember, according to Jeanette, she hadn't seen him that night after he'd gone to his family's home in Lemmy. She goes on to explain that that night she ate dinner with Paola. She had prepared a dish for Jean-Paul but when he didn't come back home, she just put it to one side, thinking maybe he had been held up at work or had just left his family a little bit late. She goes on to say it wasn't until the next morning when she was awoken by the knock on the door from the police that she even realized that Jean-Paul wasn't in bed next to her. Could this just be a coincidence? How much veal and potatoes did they eat in the north of France in the 80s? Comment below if you know. 
I imagine it was quite a lot. Now, usually in these cases where a husband or a wife dies, there is money involved. If Jeanette was involved in Jean-Paul's death, she didn't go to the trouble of staging an accident just for fun. There must be something more to it. There must be some motive behind it. And in this particular case, it doesn't take them long to find the money. A few days after Jean-Paul's death, Jeanette contacts an insurance company called La Belle Vie, where her husband had recently signed up for a life insurance policy to the sum of 120,000 euros. The problem is the contract is very recent. It was only signed a month before Jean-Paul's death. Therefore, he didn't have time to hand over a medical certificate, which was necessary to validate the policy. Not only that, the employee that wrote up the policy had never even met Jean-Paul. It was signed by Jeanette. He explains how he'd met her about a year ago through a guy called Christophe Auger, owner of a video rental shop in Lens and also a customer of La Belle Vie Insurance. The employee gave the contract to Christophe who then gave it to Jeanette, who apparently then gave it to Jean-Paul to sign. Who's this Christophe guy, you might ask? He had been in a relationship with Jeanette's daughter, Paula, but more on that later. So in a nutshell, the policy was invalid and Jeanette didn't get a penny. She isn't struggling for money though. Jean-Paul had saved up a decent amount of money, which she was starting to spend with ease. Plus he had a separate insurance policy with the post office that did pay out. She also received a fat check from a retirement fund that her husband had invested in. Jeanette gives a large chunk of this to her daughter and with the rest of the money, they buy a beautiful house in Lens. Paola also moves in with her best friend, Maxime Meurice. Maxime had just finished his military service and he didn't have anywhere to stay. On the 4th of September, 1987, despite the suspicions into Jeanette, Captain Roland writes his final report on this case and it's officially classified as a road traffic accident. Despite all his efforts, he's unable to work out how Jean-Paul ended up burnt to a crisp. In order to put the insurance claim to bed once and for all, La Belle Vie, had to hire an expert to go over the car wreckage. And this expert rips the initial report to shreds. As we may have guessed already, he says there's no way the car was going that fast. Damage to the front of the car was minimal. The handbrake was slightly on and it was in first gear. The expert sends his report to the local magistrate who'd literally just closed the case. And on reading these new findings, he immediately reopens the case and this time as a murder investigation. One year after his death on July the 27th, 1988, an anonymous call comes into the local police station and the person claims to have vital information on the death of Jean-Paul. In a calm, controlled voice, the caller says to the officer, Jean-Paul was killed in his bedroom in Ursel by his wife, Jeanette, and his daughter, Paula. They then put him in his car, drove it to the forest, and set it on fire. They did it to claim on the life insurance. These murderers need to be arrested. I'll be checking the papers every day to see if you do your job. The officer's instinct is that the caller is telling the truth. He uses their first names, suggesting maybe this person might be close to the family. Meanwhile, Jeanette is living the high life could this be the classic kill the husband for the insurance money scenario? What doesn't make sense is that Paula would be involved. From all accounts, she loved her father and wouldn't want to do him any harm. Following this call, uh, officers speak to people that knew Jeanette to try and get some more information on her. They interview the wife of Jean-Paul's brother, uh, Jeanette, like Jeanette, but Je Jeanette. She tells them that she never believed the accident theory and that she saw Jean-Paul's lighter in Jeanette's home. This is huge as Jean-Paul never let his lighter out of his sight. Police didn't find it at the crime scene so it could imply that he did go home before his death. Jean-Paul's family also confirmed he never would have signed up for another insurance policy when he already had his hefty retirement fund in place. It now seems likely to investigators that he knew nothing about it and that Jeanette signed it in his place. Coming back to the anonymous call though, what's Paola got to do with all of this? The family only had good things to say about her. 
They suggest Maxime, Paola's friend, could be the informant as he was living within the time and would have been in the perfect position to overhear something maybe he shouldn't have. Prosecutors have major suspicions now, so they bring in the mother and daughter without really any evidence, but they think maybe by interrogating them, they can squeeze something out of them. Their tactics don't work though, they stick to their story. Jean-Paul didn't come home that night, they don't know what happened to him, so they are released without charge. Then something odd happens. Jeanette reports Maxime to the police for stealing checks off her. On Saturday the 3rd of September, he is summoned and during his interrogation, he receives another summons related to the murder investigation scheduled for the next day. So when the next day arrives, the judge needs answers pretty quickly, so he lays into Maxime, who was only 20 at the time, and pretty eager for the theft charges to go away. And so Maxime starts talking. He explains to police that he met Paola at school six years ago and that he knows the family very well. He had been to Ursel on numerous occasions for dinner to sleep over and to spend time with Paola, who had told him sensitive information about her dad. According to Paola, he was violent. He recounts on one occasion how Paola and Jeanette had to jump through a window to get away from Jean-Paul, who in a mad rage had pointed a loaded gun at them. They ended up having to spend the night at a neighbor's house. He goes on to tell officers that Jean-Paul hit Jeanette on numerous occasions. However, he never witnessed this himself and Paola had never mentioned it before his death. He knows that Paola had dated Christophe over a year ago, but they broke up soon after her father's death. He also knows that Jeanette had been with several men following Jean-Paul's demise. He's not finished there. He goes on to say that the day after Jean-Paul was found in the car, during a conversation with Paola, she screamed, we killed him. What a witness this Max is turning out to be. Maxime spills this information very calmly and the judge is just about ready to fall off his chair. Not before he describes how the murder took place in Jean-Paul's room and that her and her mum have been planning this for quite some time. They wanted to get rid of him and they wanted the money. According to Max, Christophe was also involved that night. As we have already deduced, Jean-Paul never signed the insurance papers. It was Jeanette who scribbled something down and Christophe took care of the rest. He's still not done. He goes on to say that Paola was manipulated and coerced by her mum to kill Jean-Paul. According to Maxime, everything happened on the evening of Friday the 11th. Jean-Paul was asleep in his room when Christophe arrived to help carry out the act. Christophe was the first to enter the bedroom to begin the murder attempt, but he failed, finding himself pinned down by Jean-Paul who thinks he's dealing with a burglar, until he sees Paola enter the room with a golf club and smash him over the head. Then Paola and Christophe put Jean-Paul into the car and drove it to the forest. They staged the accident scene, stuck him in the front and set the fire. While this was going on, Jeanette stayed at the house to clean the blood off the carpet and the rug. This information is ridiculously powerful. Maxime has to be one of the best witnesses of all time. To confirm the facts, the judge asks Max if anyone else was privy to this information who could back up his story. He calmly turns to the judge and says, oui. Auntie Josiane also found out what happened during a heated argument with Paola. Interrogation over, a shocked judge directs Maxime to return to the police station the following morning for more questioning. Given he's been holding onto this information for over a year now, it makes him an accomplice. He only blabbed due to the theft charge hanging over his head. In the evening of September the 4th, 1988, Judge Alain Bureau signs an arrest warrant for Jeanette, Paola, Christophe, Josiane and Maxime. At this point, the case takes an even deeper and darker turn. On the morning of the 5th of September, police have received their orders to carry out the arrests and the accused give themselves up without a struggle. Josiane is interrogated first. For police, she is the weakest psychologically and that although police don't suspect her to be involved in the murder, they think she'll tell the truth. She duly informs officers that she had been sleeping with Jean-Paul. 
They then ask her about the conversation in which Paola confessed to the murder. And just like Maxime before, Josiane tells all. On the 12th of February 1987, Josiane had told Paola that she wasn't doing enough to help look after her mum. A nasty argument brews and Paola finally cracks. Quote, you'll never know what I have done for my mum. Josiane already seems to know the rest and Paola breaks down crying. I can't sleep. I hear dad's voice saying, don't do it. Officers are now convinced they have their killers. Jeanette, Paola and Christophe are all questioned at the same time in separate rooms. Jeanette continues to insist that it was Jean-Paul who signed the insurance policy. They obviously don't believe her, so they get her to perform a writing test to see if her style matches the writing on the form. If they get a match, they can prove that Jeanette was planning to kill her husband. And that, my fellow crime dogs, is premeditation, which carries a much heavier sentence. In the meantime, Paola explains that she got on well with her dad, but he was violent towards her mum. It's the first time a family member has alluded to this violent nature. Jeanette says exactly the same thing. They knew this interrogation was coming, and they've got their stories straight. They both also claim he was a heavy drinker, making the self-defense plea much more straightforward. Police then tell the pair that Maxime sold them out. He told us everything, but they hold strong. Maybe they are telling the truth. But why would Maxime and Josiane make this up? Christophe, on the other hand, is a much easier nut to crack. Apologies for all the nut puns. It doesn't take much persuasion for him to tell police that Paola and Jeanette did do it. According to Christophe, Paola confessed the following day in his video shop. They go back to Paola, question her again, and this time check her handwriting. And guess what? It's a match for the insurance form. Despite the mounting evidence and two witness confessions, she still denies everything. She will not budge. Christoph thinks by landing the other two in trouble, he's got away with it. But investigators believe that he is more involved than he is letting on. They ask him again, did you go to the house that night? Were you there? And under the mounting pressure of another interrogation, he finally caves. He says that Jeanette had told him of her intention to get rid of Jean-Paul due to his violent nature and his drinking. And he had the genius idea to get the insurance company involved so they could all make a bit of money at the same time. So on the night of the 11th, he admits going to the house in her cell at around 11 p.m. in case the women needed help killing Jean-Paul, but he was a simple spectator. He says Paolo went into the bedroom and struck him, but he woke up. Jeanette goes in to help, Paola grabs a golf club and whacks him. But the problem is police know he is lying and it's not long before he changes his story again. Christophe therefore admits he went in the room first, tried to hit Jean-Paul with an iron bar, but he missed. And the rest we already know. After 36 hours in lockup, they go back to Paola and this time it's too much for her. She bursts into tears and she recounts what really happened that night. She begins her confession by stating that her father was a very violent man. He hit her and beat up her mum. It was the night that he pointed the loaded gun at them that they first considered killing him. She explains that on the night of the 11th, he did come home just like they thought. Paola discreetly calls Christophe, who's gonna come around and help. She claims her mum Jeanette was not involved directly and was simply a bystander. She also admits to filling out the insurance form and getting Christophe involved too. When Jeanette finds out what Paola has told officers, she shouts over the room, what about our oath, before fainting on the floor. But she's not gonna get out of it that easy. On Tuesday, September the 7th, Jeanette appears before the judge. She explains that she was a beaten woman, a victim. He hit her regularly, and during the winter of 86, she had the idea to kill him. And when she spoke to her daughter about it, she was keen as well. She explains that Christoph should have got some money, but because he messed up, he got nothing. Silly Christoph. Police are not convinced by these stories of a violent and drunk husband and father. They speak to locals and neighbors in an attempt to verify Jeanette and Paola's allegations, and they can't find one person willing to back them up. So did they kill him for themselves or for the money? 
On the 25th of March, 1991, the trial of Paula, Jeanette and Christophe begins. Their self-defense line holds little water and no witnesses back up their claims. And the judge doesn't mince his words. He considers them to be calculated and cold-hearted, having planned the murder well in advance and makes the very valid point that the allegations of violence only came to light once they were backed into a corner. Jeanette is found guilty and sentenced to 18 years, Paola 15 and Christophe 10. To the people that knew him, Jean-Paul remains a very likeable person. His son David sold the house in Ursel and now lives in the south of France. Jeanette was released from prison after 11 years and Paola was also released early. The two women moved together to Lille and then also moved down to the south. The case has never really been sold 100% as the real motive could never be truly established since the domestic violence was never proven. But if you don't believe their claims, you could say that they got off with this very lightly and fabricating a life of domestic violence as an excuse for murder strikes as a heavy injustice for any woman out there who has suffered at the hands of a husband or partner. If Jean-Paul was a violent man, then there were certainly better solutions at Jeanette and Paola's disposal rather than murder. That is a wrap for this week, folks. If you made it this far, you deserve to hit the subscribe button and tap the notification bell so you'll always be up to date when we release new videos. Until next time, stay safe, merci beaucoup et au revoir.